good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Elizabeth Taylor. I'm one of the senior program managers at the NIHR Academy, and I'm going to be giving you a webinar today, which will tell you more about the doctoral fellowship. Um, do yeah, the doctoral fellowship. I'll be kicking off with a brief introduction about the Academy and who we are, and then I'll be giving more information about the Doctoral Fellowship, which the next round is set to launch on the 19th of October. We're also joined by Professor Judith Rankin, Professor of Maternal and Child Health at the University of Newcastle, and also Chair of the Doctoral Fellowship, who'll be giving a, a selection committee member perspective of what makes a good application. And then we'll also be joined by Amelia Pearson and Michael Fidel, who are current um, current doctoral fellowship award holders and they'll be able to give you their perspective on applying for the scheme as well. So the NIHR, some of you here today might not know who we are, so just a very, very brief introduction as to what we do. So the National Institute for Hair, um, Health and Care Research uh, plays a central role in England's health and care research landscape and we are funded through the Department of Health and Social Care and our mission, as on the slide there, is to improve the health and wealth of the nation through research. So this slide covers our main work streams. I'm not going to read them all out. However, it's important to know that the Academy is heavily involved in the, um, the work stream in the top right. So attracting, training and supporting the best research to tackle health and social care challenges of the future. And we do this by developing and coordinating um, training, um, career development and research capacity. And there are national competitions um, for training and career development awards. And we at the Academy are responsible for managing these. In doing so, we attract and support those people conducting leading edge research. And in doing this, we hope to develop the skills of the next generation because um, we want to invest in those who are on a trajectory to become the next re leaders in social, um, health and social care. So this is a very busy slide. It's fairly new and it lists the majority of the schemes that we have on offer, offer across the academy. So as you can see there, we span the whole of the um, whole of the training um, spectrum. So we go from pre-doctoral all the way up to chair. Um, we have had an increase in funding recently, so these are not all the um, competitions that are offered uh, um, at present at the Academy. We have um, incubators, there's the Insight Programme, um, the under, Undergraduate Internship Programme, which is launching soon as well. So this is just a, a selection, but these are the prominent schemes that we um, have here at the Academy. So obviously today we're going to be focused on the Doctoral Fellowship. Um, but before I kind of get on to the doctoral fellowship, I just want to flag about the Academy's remit for personal awards. So all applications to the NIHR Academy must meet this remit and only research that lies within the remit will be eligible for funding. So it's incredibly important that whilst developing your application that you do keep this in mind. So the full remit statement is available on the NIHR website. However, the key things that I just want to raise from this slide is that we don't support any basic research or work involving animals and that early translational applications are not um, eligible at doctoral level. Um, these applications um, are funded through our NIHR infrastructure. Um, another thing to kind of raise here is if your work involves biomarkers, so please read the remit carefully, as some of the most common reasons for applications to be rejected is that the research is too mechanistic. Um, so just be kind of wary. If you are unsure about whether your proposal does meet our Academy remit, then do feel free to send in a short um, scientific abstract and we can take a look at this and kind of advise and guide appropriately as to whether we think that that would be um, eligible for our, our schemes. So moving on, the doctoral fellowship. So I always say that the Doctoral Fellowship kind of does what it says on the tin. So it's a fellowship for, um, for all health and social care professionals, including doctors and dentists, to undertake a PhD. So you have the opportunity, if you um, are clinically based, to have part of the fellowship um, dedicated to maintaining your clinical and professional development, and you can have that up to 20%. The majority of the funding awards are in response mode. So if it's kind of you coming to us with your research idea and charity partnerships are also available through the doctoral fellowship. And that gives the support of two funders and two research communities to support your fellowship. And there's a slide shortly after this and that kind of go into 
who we're partnering with for the next round, so round 11. I've listed the eligibility criteria on the screen there. So if you are a clinical applicant, then you need to have completed the relevant pre-registration training. If you're a non-clinical applicant, um, a completion of a first degree is um, is essential. You must be a English or participate in devolved nation um, host organization, so HEI, NHS body. Um, and that if you are already registered for a PhD as well, the um, you should not have completed more than 12 months of your PhD at 100% by the time the award starts. So we give we the doctoral fellowship offers a really generous offer. So we'll it's a three year award and this can be undertaken between 50 and 100 percent. And that will go up in increments of five percent. So like 55 percent, 60, 65 percent kind of moving up to 100 percent. So we are really flexible and that's obviously dependent on your own personal circumstances as well. Um, but the, the funding that we offer is that we'll fund your full salary for the three years, um, any research costs, um, PPI costs, training development costs, so any courses, um, overseas visits, etc. There's up to £3,000 for conference related costs as well. And for this round and um, moving forward for all future rounds, we will now fund the full PhD fees um, for your associated award. The assessment criteria there, I've handpicked a few kind of um, kind of the ones that we look out for in more detail, but I'm sure Judith, Amelia and Michael will touch upon that shortly. So commitment and potential to develop uh, future health and care, um, a future health or care uh, research career. Sorry. Um, high quality research and training programs suitable for a PhD and support from the supervisory team and host organization. But as I mentioned, um, the speakers will kind of delve into a bit more detail about that in the, in the upcoming slides. So as I mentioned, we offer um, charity partnerships for the DF. Um, so for this round, which is set to launch next week, we're partnering with the four charities on the screen there. So Moorfields Eye Charity, Diabetes UK, Wellbeing of Women, and for the first time, the MND Association, so the Motor Neurone Disease Association. So these charitable partners change round by round. So if you are watching this webinar at a later date, please do check the guidance notes um, to make sure that... Um, yeah, to check which charity partners are partnering with us on each round because it is specific. But essentially, they go through the same review process as a as a normal um, NIHR fellowship. It's just that the um, the funding towards the end is kind of split off between the NIHR and the charity. So moving on to the application process. So for the DF competitions, run um, every six months. So we launch in April and October. Applications must be made through the Aramis um, application portal um, and the submission window is usually between eight to 12 weeks long and it's kind of key today and you'll hear this from our other speakers that these applications should be planned in advance of competition launching so it's really recommended that you do start thinking about it months prior to actually the the window opening. So each application is um, assessed by three um, selection committee members and then it will go through the shortlisting process so we have a shortlisted meeting where the chairs and deputies will decide who goes through to interview so if you're shortlisted for interview you'll have a panel review by it's usually around 10 to 15 selection committee members and you'll be asked questions about your project so then once the Selection Committee have decided who is recommended for funding. These are submitted to DHSC and they can confirm the outcomes where then you'll be um, notified as soon as possible prior to your award starting. So here I've just listed the competition timetable. So this is for the next round launching on the 19th of October. So the closing date is the 1st of February by um, 1 p.m. It's a hard deadline of 1 p.m. If your application goes in after this time, it will not be counted. So please do make sure you get it in on time and all the signatories and participants confirmed. The interviews for the next round are set to be held on the 19th and 20th of June. And the awards for this um, for this round will um, commence from the 1st of October to the 1st of March 2024 to 2025. I just wanted to kind of wrap up by showing you some application data from the last four rounds. So you can see there um, how many have applied round upon round. 
And you can notice like the, the applied in the eligibility number is slightly different, which is incredibly important why you need to make sure that your application does meet the remit. And you can see as well at the bottom um, bottom row there, percentage funded, it's round about 25 to 30 percent of all applications received that does get funded. So I'll link in the when you um, if you get a copy of these slides, the chair's report and the guidance notes. These are two really key documents which are um, which I would really, really recommend you reading. So the chair's report highlights um, kind of um, things from the selection committee that the chairs have noted from the previous rounds. The guidance notes contains a wealth of information that will support you. So please do read these in full. I can't stress that enough. And the Aramis portal there, I will also give you a link to. So next, I'm going to hand over to Professor Judith Rankin, who will be giving you a um, an overview of the what the selection committee um, chairs and um, members are looking for. So Judith, over to you. Thanks very much, Liz, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, just to extend my thanks to all of you for attending and being with us this afternoon. It's great to have so many of you on the call. So as Liz said, my name is Judith Rankin, and I'm Professor of Maternal and Child Health at Newcastle University. And I'm also the overall chair of the um, Doctoral Fellowship uh, panel. Uh, I've been a member of this panel for about 10 years, and I took over as the overall chair about a year ago. I also held an NHR fellowship, a senior fellowship, quite a few years ago now, but I have been on both sides of the interview panel. So I do know what it's like when you walk into that room and sit down in front of the, um, the panel. So today I've been asked to just uh, say a few words about what the um, selection committees are looking for in these applications and applicants. And I've divided this up into uh, five sections, the five P's. We used to talk about the three P's, but that's been extended now for the five P's. So that's who person, project, place plan, patient and public involvement, and um, about preparing. Next slide, please. So let's kick off with person. And I think this is um, absolutely key to any of these applications that you remember that this fellowship is all about you and your potential to become a future research leader. That's what the panel is looking for. Future, future research leaders and who has that potential. So you need to be able to demonstrate that you're on that trajectory to research leadership. And that's done by providing evidence about what you've already done. And it could be, could be things like your publications or conference presentations or reports or PPI work that you've already done, but you must give the panel that information and show them what you've already done. It may also involve um, telling them about how you're starting to build your network and what collaborators you've already begun to set up. And in some cases, it may have been that you've been able to start developing other researchers, either as um, being a mentor or, or being um, bringing them into research projects that you are already involved in. And that also can include student supervision. And absolutely fundamental is that you make it clear to the panel how gaining one of these um, fellowships is going to be that step change in your career. As Liz says, these are really highly competitive fellowships, but they absolutely can um, be a step change in your career if you are successful. Next slide, please. So now moving on to the project. And the project must be at a level that is um, appropriate for whatever level of fellowship you're applying to. And I think for the doctoral fellowship, um, you also need to remember that at the end of this, you have to produce a thesis. And clearly, writing and producing the thesis takes a lot of time. So when you're planning your project, you need to bear that in mind that you're also delivering, you're delivering on a project, but you're also delivering on a thesis. So the kind of questions you should be asking yourself when you're developing your project is, what is the research gap and how is my project going to fill that? Is the research question answerable in the time and the resources that I have available to me? Am I using the right methods, the right, uh, sorry, the right study design, and then are the right methods falling out of that? Have I included patient public service oh. users in what I'm planning and have, are they supporting me with developing? What's, what it is that I want to do. And then of course, is the project at all feasible and ethical? 
Um, we are not in the position of setting people up to fail with these fellowships. We are really keen to support as many applications as we can, but obviously as a panel, we need to judge that they are actually can be delivered on. And what we also want to see is that you really are up to date in your own knowledge about um, the current studies in your area. And you do you are asked to sort of give a brief overview of that. And we do look to make sure that you've got all the, all the key studies that you would need that are, are relevant to your project. Next slide, please. Then moving on to place. So where are you going to do this fellowship? And we look very carefully at the host organisation and whether it is the right place to support you during your fellowship. Um, so in that, we look for a very sort of personalised host institutions uh, statement. So one that's looking at you and your own development and your research area and how that um, aligns with the overall strategy of the department you're going to be built, uh, based in and the university. So while you may include some generic things about the host institution, we actually we want these statements to go well beyond that and to show us that the um, institution is there to support you as uh, and your research. Um, also important in this is your is your supervisors. So um, each um, applicant can ask for up to four supervisors. You don't have to have four supervisors, but it does tend to be now that it is three or four supervisors, given the very multidisciplinary nature in which we work. So think very carefully about who your supervisors are going to be. And it may be that actually it's it's not just a case of uh, the people around you who you get on well with. Really think about what you need in your supervisory team. And the kind of things that the panel will be looking for is do they have the right expertise? Are they, do they have enough time to give you? What is their current doctoral and um, supervision experience? Do they have so many doctoral um, students plus the rest of the, what they do that they really, realistically, they aren't going to be able to give you the time that you need? Do they complement each other as a team? And then we'll also be looking to see if there's anything missing in terms of the support that you'll need. And I would really encourage you to think about supervisors from outside your institution. So obviously you would have some from inside, but it's really great to get that um, externality, that external view of your work and what you're doing. And of course, depending on what it is you are doing as a project, um, the best person to supervise you may be out with your um, current institution. Next slide, please. So then we move on to your own your training plan. So this is really about your personal development. What is it that you need that is going to um, support you in being that uh, future leader and being on that trajectory? And this is something, again, that the panel takes very, very seriously. Um, and we expect that you will have done uh, a good amount of thinking around developing your training and development plan and done, you know, a lot of self-reflection in terms of what is it you need to get to the next stage um, of your career. And that's not just about maybe methods development and training courses to do with stats or your methods that you're using, but this is also about you as a future leader. So think about courses that can offer you methods training, personal development training. And of course, we do also um, encourage you to get out there and do go to conferences and build up your network. And there may be occasion where um, a research visit to a collaborator somewhere else in the world um, would be really advantageous to your project and to your own development as a researcher. Now, clearly, and that's not maybe always possible for every applicant, but it is something to consider if it fits in with the rest of your life that you, you can ask for in these fellowships. What I will stress is that we do look very carefully at the justification for that visit. We are incredibly supportive um, of them, but we do want to make sure that you will get something hugely benefit to, beneficial to yourself and to the project by doing this visit. Um, so take the personal development uh, training and planning uh, plan very seriously, spend the right time on it, make sure the courses are right for your needs and don't rely on just what the university offers in terms of what they, what they offer for any PhD student. Next slide, please. 
We then move on to patient and public involvement, and clearly this area has, has become incredibly important and is, a, and is an, in a crucial part of how you, do, how you go about designing your project. So really encourage you to think about patient and public involvement from the outset when you, you've decided that you, you are going to go for one of these fellowships and you're designing your project. This should be um, an absolute real partnership or collaboration. We can see through it if it looks incredibly tokenistic. We will have um, a P a, with our two PPI representatives on the panels at interview. They are always given time to ask questions. So please do um, make sure that there's a meaningful and um, partnership that you're developing with your PPI reps. We also like to see how that partnership has influenced what you're planning to do in your project. So there are um, sections of the form that enable you to say exactly what that um, collaboration has helped change in your project and how your project has benefited. We do like to see training in, in included. So this is training for PPI members themselves, depending what role they might be taking in your, in your application and your project. But also I would stress to you again that you as the fellow probably could do with some training. So do include training for yourself as well, unless you've got you know, lots and lots of experience of doing PPI, which I, I appreciate some applicants may have. And then, of course, we do uh, want to see that any contributions from PPI members are appropriately costed. And I'll just put um, a link in, but you can easily find the link to the payment guidance that the NHR recommends for PPI contributions. Next slide, please. Another area that's really important to consider when you're putting your application together is equality, diversity inclusion, and inclusion. And the NHR published their um, EDI strategy last year, and these are the, the five pillars of, the, of that strategy. So again, I would encourage you to, <coughs> excuse me, to think about EDI, and not just in terms of, as you go about, if you're recruiting um, individuals to your sample, how you go about that to make sure it's as diverse a sample as possible. But also when you're thinking about how you're building your network and those that you're going to collaborate with, think again about making that as diverse as, as possible. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and then finally we come to preparation, the, the, the fifth P. And this is preparation pre-application, but also preparation if you were to be shortlisted for the interview. And as Liz has already alluded to, these take a huge amount of time to put together. There are a lot of pieces to put in this particular jigsaw. I do a lot of talking to individuals who are thinking about applying to this. And what I always say to them is that you should start um, an application 12 months ahead of the date that you want to submit to. Um, just to give yourself enough time to put all those jigsaw pieces in place. So there's some, some homework to do before you even just make that decision and to help you make that decision, which is really to know about the process and make sure you're absolutely aligned to the NHR remit, as Liz emphasised. And that's things like looking at the website, um, getting guidance from, from there and others within your institution, etc., and attending things like this webinar, of course, as well. The, pro, the NHR program managers are absolutely fantastic, incredibly helpful. Please do contact them and ask any questions you have. It's much better to ask those questions at the beginning than wait until maybe you're trying to submit and you realise you, you haven't quite met, met the remit. Um, contact the NHR Academy with queries and also talk to your local um, NHR. NHR RSS, which used to be the RDS, um, but is now been um, changed to the, I'm just quickly going to remind myself of it, the Research Support Service. And as I've already said, start your PPI early, make sure it doesn't look like an afterthought, make sure it's really embedded into your application and the work that you plan to do. And as you're writing your application, do do some homework around knowing who your audience is going to be. Um, so talk to other award holders, talk, you, can, you can talk to panel members, don't feel that you can't approach panel members to get some advice um, and anybody with any topic expertise that you, that you, uh, you know. Keep talking, keep talking to your supervisors as you bring in your supervisory team together. 
Um, anything, if it's some method, you need to have your methodology worked out, speak to individuals in that field, speak to collaborators, mentors, and everybody who will listen to you and give you advice. I can't emphasize that enough, that you really do learn so much from talking to people who've been in this situation before and gone on to make a successful application. Next slide. And then if you are successful enough to be shortlisted and be invited to interview, the NHR publishes the members of the selection panels. You know, this isn't a secret. They're all on, online. So do go and look at the selection panels and have a think about what areas are represented, who, who is it that might end up being asked, you know, one of your interviewers. Remember that you're writing for the expert, but you're also writing for a panel that's made up of a number of people with a number of different from a number of different disciplines and may not know anything about your area of research of research, but want to be able to follow your application and actually and actually understand what the research gap is and why this is so important to fund. And as I've already said, uh, we have PPI members on the on the um, panels and they will be reading your application as well. Can't encourage you enough to do mock interviews. Um, these are really, really helpful. I am terrifying, but helpful. I often say to folk, the worst interview I had was my mock interview. It was absolutely terrifying. So much, the actual interview was so much easier than the mock interview, but I'd got so much of the nerves and the uh, difficult questions out of the way that I was very prepared for the, for the actual interview. Have a think yourself about what questions you might get asked. Ask those who've maybe shared and looked at your application to come up with potential lists of questions. And be ready to think on your feet because it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to be asked, well, if one if work package fails, what would you do? How would you make sure that your whole project didn't go down the drain? So think about that plan B. And remember, this is about selling yourself. You know, we want to see enthusiastic people with a real passion for what their research area is and a real passion for being a future leader. So look as if you enjoy talking about your project. Um, and please do remember that when we're not there trying to generate trick questions, if anything, we're, really, we're there to try and generate questions that we think will really support you in the interview. But we do have to make sure that everybody that is recommended for funding meets a particular bar. Um, so we do need to ask some, you know, delving questions. But the panel is there to, to try and get as many people as forward recommended for applications. And they really do want you to do well at interview. Next slide, please. So just I've got two more slides that I'm just going to quickly run through, which um, summarise some common weaknesses that I've seen over the last few years of, of being involved in this and that others have commented on as well. So we've touched upon this already, so I won't dwell on it, but the importance of remit and making sure that your um, project does, re does meet the NIHR remit. So that's not about mechanistic research. That's somebody else's remit. It's not NIHR. Clarity and detail, so make sure your research questions are clear, make sure that you show the panel the importance of the work and you give them sufficient detail to understand what it is you want to do. We want you to put forward a, an ambitious project, we want you to fill a research gap, we want the work to be novel, but we also, as I've already um, alluded to, we want it to be achievable within the time that you have. Um, so do do remember that when you're you're building all of this and, and what you're um, committing to and also remembering you've got to, to write the thesis up. In terms of the applicant, some common weaknesses is that the applicant maybe isn't just quite at the right level to be applying. We do expect um, applicants to maybe have some publications. We're not expecting hundreds, but a few publications, maybe some funding, um, maybe some conference uh, attendance, things like that, we already expect that you've, you've done some of that. We also can quite easily tell when the project isn't the applicants. Um, maybe it's a project that's been um, redesigned slightly for a fellowship application, but it's still a project. Emphasize again, these aren't project grants. These are training fellowships. So make sure 
that it doesn't read like a project grant or that it's just one of your supervisors hasn't been successful with the project grant and is putting it now through a fellowship. Um, so this is all about you. It's your trajectory, your abilities, your potential. So we don't like seeing us, we, etc. Now, all of this work um, collaboratively and in other circumstances and forums for us, we do, we do talk about we. But because of this, it's a personal fellowship. It's about you. I did this. This wouldn't have happened unless I, my leadership had done this, etc. Next slide, please. Okay, um, training, again, the, the training program is really, really fundamental to these, to these personal training fellowships. Sometimes we see program, uh, training programs that are just too generic. They're the usual things that everybody would do as a PhD student and that their host institution offers, but they haven't taken the time to include courses that are specific to the applicants and projects need. Uh, that they're bit, they, they aren't getting that externality in terms of going elsewhere for training courses. And it's absolutely emphasized that these are training fellowships. So we really like, we really want to see a really exciting train, training program. In terms of um, supervisory team, uh, common weaknesses are just the fit isn't right, or there's maybe something missing in terms of an area that you'll need supervision, supervision in or that the supervisors haven't got enough doctoral um, training experience or they've got too much, that is, they've got too many PhD st um, students. So we do like to see evidence of what that commitment will be from the supervisory team and we need to be convinced by it. So this isn't about getting the most well-known person in your field to be one of your supervisors because we know that that person is very unlikely to have the time to give you um, as a supervisor. And on to environment. So this really is needs to be clear how your work fits in with your host departments or and institution. We don't want you to be there working away on your own with no support from others in, in the area. Um, so we do look to see that the host department has taken you and your research very seriously and, and has demonstrated that in their statement. Um, and they've got a, a commitment to you as the candidate. Obviously, given the nature of this work, we would expect you to be in a host institution that does applied health research. And it's fine to stay in the same environment that you might have been for a while, as long as you make it really clear to us why that is the best place for you and for your work and for your future career development. And in terms of value for money, um, we the NHR are very generous in these um, and these applications, but we do look for anything that might just be unrealistic in terms of what's needed. And um, so, again, it is about justifying the resources that you're asking for. But if something requires a certain amount of money and you've justified it well, then there's, it, it would go through um, if you were to be recommended for funding. Next slide. Okay, so I'm just going to try and draw all of that together. I hope you've picked up both from what Liz has said and what I've said that you really must start these applications early. These are not things that, not applications that you can put together in, in two or three months. Absolutely not. Be, make yourself really aware of the guidelines and criteria before you start so that you know your what you want to do as well within the NHR remit. Get all the advice and the constructive criticism that you can get while you're preparing your application. It's much better to get that from your peers and your colleagues than to realise when you're sitting on the panel that you haven't quite done something. Um, show it your own work. As I said, this is a personal training fellowship. It's not a project grant. So we must know that it's both your own work and also that it is appropriate for a training fellowships. And remember that we are looking for those future research leaders. So help us in terms of seeing what you've already done and what that trajectory would look like for you. And do please pay attention to detail, give yourself enough time to do a good proofread of your application and read across the application so that something that you've said in one section ties up with something that you say in, a, in a, another section of the application. Next slide. 
So that's that's all for me, just to say that I have summarised this in a blog. The link is there if you want to take a look at that. As Liz says, you will get the, the slides if you um, complete the feedback form. And the next slide just um, gives you some links. There will be others, but I've just included some links there that might be helpful. And there have been, and you are going to hear from some of our successful um, applicants, but there are other um, YouTube videos and things from people who've been successful. So I'll leave it there. Thank you all. And um, I'll hand back to Liz. Yeah, thank you, Judith. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Amelia Pearson, who has recently been awarded a doctoral fellowship, and she's also a previous pre-doctoral fellowship award holder as well. So Amelia, over to you. Uh, thanks, Liz. Hopefully uh, you can all hear me. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Amelia Pearson and I am a previous NIHR pre-doctoral fellow and a research, a recent um, doctoral fellowship awardee. Uh, my research focus is social care and I'm based at the University of Manchester um, at a research group called Social Care and Society. Um, I submitted a doctoral fellowship application in January this year um, and I interviewed in June. Um, and I'm so happy to be successful and um, obviously to have the opportunity to share my experience of applying today. Um, for some context, my research focus um, is the experience of moral injury in social workers. Um, and my research proposal is all around developing um, a conceptual model for social workers and informing organizational support. Um, so here's a quick overview of my background leading up to my application. Um, I completed a psychology undergraduate degree and following this worked as a research administrator. Um, I became interested in a research career and began my pre-doctoral fellowship. Um, and this really developed my knowledge and practical experience when preparing for um, in preparation for PhD. Um, and during this fellowship, I did begin um, my NIHR doctoral fellowship application. Uh, next slide, please, Liz. Um, so firstly, I found it really helpful to start off by splitting the application into these sections, which I've now realised um, align with some of the P's that um, Judith has just been mentioning. Um, and although these do all link together, um, looking at it this way made it less overwhelming. Um, and it also helped me to, de to dedicate um, sufficient time to all areas rather than prioritise one. Um, I also used the headings in the guidance notes in my application, which um, I think helped make sure that I was addressing everything that um, the panel were looking for. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so writing about your background really provides the opportunity to tell the panel who you really are, um, to show your passion and to sell yourself as a competitive candidate. Um, I included as much detail as possible around any um, relevant training or modules that I'd completed um, and any practical research activities that I contributed to. And I tried to make it really clear whether I'd led any of these activities. Um, I mentioned conferences and engagement activities um, and whether I presented any research at these. Um, and I really tried to think about um, what each of these meant for my development so far um, and how they kind of got me to this stage. Um, I use bullet points and um, like bolding of words uh, to really get my point across and showcase my experience. Um, it feels really awkward selling yourself, but I guess if you don't believe it's true, then the panel probably won't either. Um, and I really try to think about um, like, why me? So why should I receive this award? Why should I be the one to do this research project? And also why now in my career um, pathway? So I wrote about my career goals and what the fellowship um, meant for these, how it would go to um, work towards achieving them. So remember here that you're not applying for a PhD, you're applying for a career development fellowship. So really think about um, your long term plan. And I also thought a lot about why I wanted to apply for the NIHR. And as much as they want to know what you'll bring, um, you really need to think about what becoming part of this NIHR community will mean for you. Uh, next slide, please. So designing the research proposal feels really daunting at first. Um, believe me, I felt very overwhelmed as my supervisors can probably confirm. Um, there's a lot of support out there to help you though. You're not gonna have all the answers overnight. So give yourself time and let your ideas evolve. Think big and be ambitious, but the project needs to be achievable by you and within the PhD timescale, like Judith said. 
I wanted to include developing um, a quantitative self scale for model injury, but I decided that this wasn't realistic on top of the necessary conceptual development work. So instead I just mentioned this as a um, future career direction. I also spent a lot of time developing connections across social care, which helped inform my idea, um, and many of which became project collaborators. So don't underestimate how far um, an email can take you. Um, I contacted a lot of uh, networks and groups, just introducing myself and my research idea to see if they were interested um, and wanted to support the project. So most of these emails do actually lead to really meaningful discussions. And any decisions that you make, you need to be prepared to justify these at interview. So I used references to show that I knew my stuff and had done the reading. Um, I also engaged with the research support service um, and used online resources like the EDI toolkit. And finally, really think about um, what this means in the end. So it's great having a strong methodological approach, but are you, are you planning to get your findings out there? Are they gonna generate meaningful change? And what steps are you going to achieve this? So I actually consulted with some impact officers um, within my host institutions to find out if that support is available for you. Uh, next slide. Um, I thought a lot about what patient and public involvement meant for me in my research, and I tailored a plan to suit the needs of my project. And this is where my engagement with the research support service really helped because um, I struggled a lot to define what involvement meant for my research because it was a social care project and a workforce project. Um, and then when writing this up in the um, application, I specified details of you know, who I involved, how they contributed, and I gave some examples of how my proposal actually improved as a result of this. And when writing up uh, my plans, um, I provided information of um, how I was gonna engage um, with people, what activities I was planning, who these were, um, and how frequently I was planning on meeting with members. Um, I also used the PPIE financial guidance that Judith mentioned, because there are different payment rates for different activities and different expenses that you might want to budget for. I then went through my um, PPI plan with a supervisor. Um, definitely um, get public uh, members of the public to feedback on your plain English um, summary and your involvement plan because my changed um, a lot because of this. Uh, next slide please. Um, I think I was probably going to just repeat what Judith said. I think she covered quite a lot but um, in my plan I was really honest about my individual weaknesses and how I could address these through training um, I revisited my career goals um, and what I felt I needed to do to get there. So I didn't focus solely on completing the proposed research, but I looked beyond. Um, I'd say don't restrict yourself to your host institution or your like geographical location. Consider the benefits of learning in different environments um, and try and create a diverse networking plan. So I really considered how each element would um, raise my research profile as well as um, help disseminate my research. Um, and thought about where in the three years um, these would generate the maximum impact. Um, so an example I can use is that I identified the International Centre for Moral Injury, um, which is obviously my research topic. And here I, I can bring a social care perspective um, and engage with experts. Um, but then I also identified different um, social care specific events where I can engage with um, you know, similar researchers and um, key stakeholders within the sector. Um, so I think the panel just really want to understand your thinking and um, kind of like why you've chosen each component. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, to reiterate what Judith said, um, I tried to pick a supervisory team that was diverse and well-rounded, um, who can bring different ideas and contributions. Um, I didn't focus just on methodological expertise, but I considered whether they were passionate about um, the research area, my development, um, you know, will they provide opportunities um, to network, you know, nationally or globally? Um, and so I did my own research on my potential supervisors. Um, and some of them can just come from a conversation. So one of my um, supervisors was actually just from an email because um, they were experienced in doing concept mapping method. Um, and I wanted to know more about this. And after a number of discussions, um, I realized that they were really passionate and, um, you know, they were interested in my development. Um, in the application, um, I thought it was important to establish exactly what elements of the research and the fellowship each supervisor would help me with, how much contact time we'd have, 
um, and whether they had um, supervised PhD students or fellows in the past. And I think at this stage, it's really important to um, keep an eye on how responsive they are to you. And if they aren't supporting you at this stage, um, they probably won't support you, you know, during the research. So they're probably not going to be a very good supervisor. Um, as Liz said, um, there are signatories and participants to confirm on the RMS platform. Um, so, you know, make them aware of your deadlines early on and check if they've got um, any leave scheduled and things like that. Just don't leave it to the last minute. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so after applying in January, I was informed in May that I was successful for an interview, which then took place in July. Um, this is a five minute presentation followed by around 20 minutes, I think, of questions. Uh, mine was hybrid, so I was on Zoom um, and the panel were on, obviously on Zoom, but um, together in like a U shape. Um, I went about preparing by trying to make my presentation as good as possible. Um, this is really the only thing you can control. I practiced to anyone, including by myself. Um, I went through my, my application in a lot of detail. Um, I prepared potential responses. Um, and like Judith said, I did a lot of mock interviews and these really helped prepare you um, to speak in um, kind of like this interview and Q&A &A style. And they, they aren't fun, but you know, I became a lot more confident from them. Um, my personal advice would be to remember that you are the expert of your application and your proposal. Your passion will naturally come across and the interview really is just an opportunity for the panel to find out more um, about you and for you to show them that you're confident and capable. Um, it's a whirlwind of emotions, um, adrenaline, relief, excitement and uh, a lot of pride. Um, just try and take time to celebrate um, both submitting the application and if you um, have an interview because both of them are massive achievements. Um, next slide. So, yep, just thank you very much for listening. And if you are submitting an application, um, best of luck. Thank you, Amelia, for that. Um, I will swiftly hand over to Michael Fidel, who is a current doctoral fellowship award holder. So he'll also be giving you a bit of background about how his um, doctoral fellowship application went and kind of currently what he's working on as well as part of his fellowship. So I will stop sharing my slides. There we go. Do you want to yep. share those? Perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah, super. Yeah, great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Michael. I'm a biosurgical trainee at Imperial College London. Um, I completed a pre-doctoral fellowship prior to starting my NIHR doctoral fellowship in April earlier this year. Um, the aim of my research is to develop and validate a non-invasive breath test to detect colorectal cancer. So to begin with, I'm going to present my timeline of the application process. As um, Professor Rankin and, and Amelia have covered them already, I will only uh, briefly touch on the three Ps, um, well, with, um, three of the five Ps, um, person, place, and project, um, which form the, the structure of the application, as well as the mark scheme of the selection committee. I will go over some tips and key points to help you put together a strong application, and I'll describe my interview experience. I will also provide a list of useful resources to conf to consider throughout the application process and mention some benefits of holding such an award. And this will leave us with enough time at the end to go over some questions. Um, so I applied for the uh, round eight doctoral fellowship. Um, as you can see, the application window opened in April, 2022, and the application had to be submitted by July 21st. Um, so that means the window was open for just over three months. The shortlisting for interviews um, were released um, in October and the interview took place roughly five weeks later. Um, you find the outcome of the interview six to eight weeks after as the funding needs to be approved by the Department of Health and Social Care. So in my case, the three year fellowship started um, on April the 1st this year. <clears throat> so the first um, section of the application is mainly based on your research background. This includes any previous qualifications, employment positions, prizes, publications, research grants, as well as the impact of the fellowship on your career and your potential to become a future um, health research leader. The next section of the application and assessment criteria is the project. 
this starts off with a lay summary um, of the research. Um, I will come with, I will cover some of the resources later, but um, this was reviewed by members of my PPI group and the fast track review service um, offered by the research support service. Um, this lay summary is essential, um, as I understand members of the panel often re refer back to the section during the um, kind of assessment criteria and decision making process. This is followed by a detailed methods and analysis plan where you should also describe the potential impact of the research on the patients, the public and healthcare services. You will need to ensure that the methodology chosen is suitable to answer your proposed um, research question. And you should describe how you have involved PPI in developing your proposal, how they will be involved in the future, including any training and support that you will be able to provide for them. Finally, on the application, you will need to demonstrate how your institution will support the project and your development. You will need to describe your proposed training program internally and externally, as Amelia has mentioned. And this includes the training you will undertake to support your development as a future health research leader. Your chosen supervisors should work well together, each have a specific defined role, and it should ideally have a, um, a kind of proven track record in your research area. Um, here, I've listed a few suggestions, which I think are helpful um, in putting forward a strong application. So as Amelia mentioned, uh, make sure you read the applicant guidance in detail, and you can divide your writing up as directed by the guidance to make sure you cover all the points and to keep it structured. The guidance will also help with the costings and the maximum budget for each individual category. Uh, for example, um, when I applied in this, and it sounds the same now, the, the maximum for conferences and travel was £3,000. Uh, make sure you involve the research support service as early as possible. Um, I worked with them from early April and they and I found them to be really extremely helpful. Um, they provided useful feedback towards my application, helped with organizing fast track reviews of my lay summary and later organized mock interviews. Involve the finances team at your institution early. Um, I would say at least one month before um, the submission deadline, if not before. Um, there will be changes to your budget along the way, and the finances team will need uh, make will need time to review it. Talk to everyone about your idea, um, colleagues, supervisors, the support service, even your partner or your peers. Um, for example, reviewing the lay summary and for the mock interviews. And as Professor Rankin said, you need to find the right balance between being ambitious, but also ensuring your project is realistic and feasible um, within the time period. It's unlikely that they'll fund a project that is deemed to be uh, risky and will probably not be completed within the three years. But always, um, always consider backup plans, key risks of your project and contingencies. And um, previously we said before, but um, just to kind of reinforce it, uh, remember that this is a fellowship rather than a project grant, i.e. they are funding you. So take ownership of your proposal, demonstrate how this fellowship can help with your own personal academic development. Uh, feel free to use um, to, to use the headings in the applicant guidance and use, a white, and use white spaces, uh, bullet points, um, avoid any jargon um, in the lay summary, Make sure it's really clear and easy to understand and think broad and deep um, in regards to your own training and development program. Um, in addition, you'll need to provide a justification of your budget, which includes the conference travel fees, consumables, the PPI costs, and you should take into account uh, refreshments and travel. And um, ensure you embed PPI and EDI throughout your application where possible, not just in the Kind of allocated PPI section. And finally, um, you'll be required to upload a research timetable or a Gantt chart um, at the end of the application. Um, so I've kind of provided a list of key points that I've um, come up with uh, for you to kind of consider for your application and interview, um, the feasibility of the project within the three years, and that should be reflected by your Gantt chart, uh, in-depth literature knowledge, um, cystics, which um, kind of depends on your project, but um, I had to include a relevant kind of uh, power calculation 
and also inc include the courses you wish to undertake um, in this area. If, if, for example, stats is one of your particular weaknesses, then this should be kind of covered by uh, relevant courses. Um, clearly kind of um, consider PPI and dissemination to the public by PPI groups, conferences, uh, social media, um, and state how often you'll meet your supervisors and ensure they have enough time to provide the necessary support. And finally, um, risk assessment and backup plans. So if something goes wrong, make sure you've considered any backup plans to ensure the success and completion of your project. And so just to provide um, some context um, of my research as part of the fellowship, um, it, in my case, it was a multi-center case control study um, where a breath test has been performed in over 700 patients. Um, and I'm analyzing the breath samples to look for small molecules called volatile organic compounds using mass spectrometry. And I will be using um, statistical analysis to develop a de detection model. The development and validation of a triage breath test um, should, will be used by GPs, clinicians, and provide patients with early diagnosis, improved survival, as well as streamlining the patient pathway, and ultimately provide cost savings for the NHS. And this is what the reviewers were looking for based on my feedback. So um, a track record in education and research, uh, research. Is a PhD the correct next step for the applicant's trajectory? Does the chosen method actually address the research question that you have stated? Um, and I think in my case, the, the reviewers looked positively on the fact that I was involved in the entire delivery of the project, from development to patient recruitment, running and analyzing the samples using mass spectrometry, and statistical analysis, as well as dissemination of the findings. And always think about, um, is the research um, kind of likely um, to reach the patients in the relatively near future? Um, does the so um, does the training and development plan cover all aspects? Um, for example, in my case, um, I'll be doing mass spectrometry and statistical analysis. Therefore, there sh um, I had to state training for this. Um, so stats courses, mass spectrometry courses, overseas visit, for example, um, in mass spectrometry. But, but also, um, as Professor Rankin said, th don't forget the kind of personal development training, for example, writing papers, writing grant applications, team and leadership. Um, so regarding the interview process, um, this was my experience. So I was given a list of panel members three to four weeks um, prior to my interview. On the day, there were approximately 12 panel members. Uh, two of the panel members um, were, were selected beforehand and they asked um, the questions, followed by a PPI panel member. And then if there is enough time at the end, uh, questions are opened up to the floor. And um, please, please just remember that this is, my, this is how my interview was structured and it may change by the time um, you're called up for an interview. Um, so my interview was held on Zoom. Um, I was asked to give a five minute PowerPoint presentation on my research proposal and training development plan. Um, you have an additional one minute, um, which is optional if you provide a slide on the implications of COVID-19 on your research proposal. Um, this was followed by 20 minutes of questions on the study design, training development plan, PPI, and the potential impacts of the study um, to patients and the wider public. In terms of preparation, um, I would critique your own application to identify any holes, any weaknesses, and likely questions, and organize as many mock interviews as possible. And as I said, the research support service can help with this, um, but also arrange mocks with your within your department, colleagues, partner, and peers. Uh, so during my interview, I was asked if anything had changed um, since I submitted the application. As my research was based on quite a large multi-center study, I had to justify the feasibility of the study. For example, the X number of patients with colorectal cancer are seen at this hospital um, in a given year, or we know from previous studies in breath that the breath test is acceptable to patients um, and so on. I also had to justify the timelines of mass spectrometry and the analysis, 
and also consider any backup plans and have I left enough time to carry this out? Um, I had to explain the benefits the breath test may have on patients and the public. Um, I was asked how often um, I will see my supervisors and what, what expertise they will bring. I also um, also covered the benefits of the PPI to the project, for example, reviewing the lay summary, patient information leaflets, the study design, um, the impact they had on the inclusion exclusion criteria, and the impact um, they had that have on dissemination during the fellowship. Um, and finally, um, I was asked what are the next steps um, of the research proposal following my fellowship. So re regarding useful resources, um, I've listed a few here. So as Professor Rankin said and has said, there's the NIHR chairs report, um, which can be found on the website, which shows you how many people have applied in previous rounds and the number of successful applicants. There's also notes from the chair um, previous years as to why the fellowship applications were not successful. This tends to be um, you know, lack of taking ownership of your projects, um, lack in feasibility, or the supervisory team are not equipped enough, um, or not, not equipped to support the key aspects of the proposal. The RSS hold events and workshops on fellowship guidance and PPI, and they provide support via the NIHR Public Involvement Fund and the Fast Track Service. So the Public Involvement Fund um, can help you start a PPI group up to a free, um, 350 pounds budgets provided to, to host PPI meetings, travel, refreshments, with the aim to set, set up a PPI group for your research. Um, and lay, lay members of the public can review your um, plain English summary within often within two weeks using the fast track service. Uh, people in research also provide resources for public involvement um, and dissemination. And the NIHR EDI toolkit provides ways and ideas to incorporate EDI in your design, uh, budgeting, patient recruitment, and dissemination. So um, just to finish off, the, um, in conclusion, the NIHR is a, it's a wonderful community uh, to be a part of, provides you with plenty of opportunities and opens doors for collaborating and networking. Uh, for example, there's a doctoral research training camp, and this week there was NIHR Academy Members Conference. Um, the fellowship allows you to have protected academic time to complete the research to the best of your ability and provides funding for consumables to carry out the research um, effectively um, and also helps enhances your personal development through courses, conferences, training, and it also really provides you with a stepping stone to apply for further funding in the future and kind of boosting your own personal academic development. Okay. Thank you very much for listening and good luck with the application. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, could I ask all the panelists to just switch on their mics and cameras? Um, we're a bit over time. So what I'll do, I'll give an extra five minutes for a quick Q&A. Um, and then if you have any questions that are left unanswered, if you could email the Academy. So Asma will put the email in the chat for you. Um, yeah, so if we can't get around to it um, this afternoon, then yeah, we'll answer it um, offline. So, Asma, do you want to facilitate the Q&A? We've got a few questions and yeah, we've been answering them throughout the webinar as well. So um, we will prioritise those that have been upvoted the most. Yeah, so, thanks Liz. Yeah, do you want to go with the yeah. first one? Yeah, we've had lots of questions in, so thank you, everyone. Um, we've got a question here from Laura. How about if you have supervisors from two different academic institutions, can you provide guidance as how to manage this? Um, um, I'll come in, but Amelia did a fantastic answer on that in her presentation. Amelia, I don't know if you want to just go over how you, you did that, because I thought it was really good in your presentation. Um, I'm wondering what I said now. <laughs> um, I think it's important to have different supervisors from different um, institutions. So I don't think that is a bad thing that you need to overcome. Um, I think 
people will have different need, uh, like different experiences and skills that they can contribute. And naturally that means that, pe that supervisors will come from different uh, backgrounds and institutions. Um, I think that the application actually encourages this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have, I have two supervisors at the University of Manchester and one at um, Bangor University. Um, and I think it's just making um, an effort to make it a collaborative kind of like supervisory team, um, you know, make, making it clear when you're gonna meet people one-to-one -one and having, um, you know, team meet, uh, like supervisory team meetings. Um, and I don't know, I, I guess so. I'm yet to find out though, that, <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't expect that you'll meet as a full team every week or anything, but just indicate in the application who's the primary supervisor. So the person that you would meet on a very regular basis. And then we would expect, obviously, that you meet as a whole team, maybe, I don't know, depending on the project, four or five, six times a year. So, but that is a very common area to be asked about an interview, how you are going to manage if you've got a, a combination of internal and external um, supervisors but you know in this world of zoom and teams and everything else it's it, it's probably easier than it used to be but it is important that you've thought that through with your supervisory team and you can um talk to the panel about how it's going to work for you and your supervisory team great thank you judith and amelia we've got a question here from matt i am a ppie specialist in mental health as a current nihr pre-doctoral fellow my host organization is my local mental health trust, where I chair the local LEAP group and have many PPIE colleagues, including mentors. For my doctoral application, I want to continue to specialize in mental health PPIE. However, does the host organization have to be the academic institution of my primary supervisor, as this would mean that I would need to change host organizations from my local mental health trust? So I've got a bit of, I guess, news hot off the press for round 11 in terms of host organisation and employing organisation. So I've just got the guidance notes up here. So any applicants now moving forward for the doctoral fellowship, you will choose whether you want to be remaining employed by your current employer or whether you want to move to um, your proposed host organisation. So there's a lot of guidance within the um, the new guidance notes that are coming out in the next week or so. But essentially, you shouldn't have to move organisation or employing organisations if you want to kind of remain where you are. Um, if your host, if was it the host, um, your primary supervisor was based at your host institution, then yeah, it's down to it's down to yourself to kind of decide whether moving host um, employing organizations would be best for you but there's not a mandatory step for you to now have to do that um, moving forwards um because we're trying to make sure that um like especially kind of clinicians moving from like um from your employing organization in nhs to like move into a host organization we don't want you to kind of have to be kind of forced to move to a HEI if you are wanting to kind of remain at your NHS trust. So there's a lot more guidance in the guidance notes. I don't know if any of the other panellists want to come in as well on that point, but yeah, moving forwards um, is something that the NHR have, have recognised and we are um, we are doing something about it. You'll be pleased to hear. I'll just, just maybe very quickly just say, so we, yeah. increasingly we're getting applications from trusts and other organizations rather than HEIs. Obviously you need to have an HEI involved because it's an academic piece of work you're doing. Um, again, I would just go back to what we were emphasizing around the host institution being the best place for you to support you personal development and your research. So I think that's the kind of thinking you need to do where, where it's going to be best for me. And that might be where you're already based, which is great, but it might not be. And it, you know, we. This is you securing, securing your potential as a future researcher, and it is best to make a move earlier on in your career if that's the best thing for you. Do we have time for one more, Liz? Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Okay, so if one supervisor has no previous experience of supervision, I would be her first. If I have two other supervisors, 
for extensive experience with supervision, is this okay? And Judith? Yeah, so um, we look at the supervisory team as a whole. So we're looking at all of the members of that. Um, mostly they do tend to all have some level of supervisory experience, but your lead supervisor is the one we really focus on in terms of their um, supervisory experience. So whoever you nominate as the lead supervisor, I would say, yes, absolutely, they must have the appropriate experience. But if you look at the mix, then if you've got, for example, four supervisors and maybe one was, you know, had only supervised one, one doctoral student before or this you were their first, then that we would just look at that as a whole. I mean, my own view in that is how are we going to get future supervisors if we don't um, take a punt maybe on some people, if they're in with other more experienced um, supervisors, then there's not really a risk. Thanks, Jenny. Sorry, I was just going to say that I think um, it's, it's quite nice to have a bit of diversity in that way. I've got two quite experienced supervisors um, and one less experienced supervisor, but you know they might be able to um, commit more time to me. And my primary supervisor isn't necessarily the one with the most experience or the most publications, um, but my primary supervisor is the person that's going to support me the most. Um, so I think well, that's how I approached it. And then just to make in, in my case, I had um, four supervisors, but. Um... What I kind of mainly thought about was what each one could bring to the the research. So, for example, one was a kind of breath test expert. One was a um, consultant on the ground, so it could help with patient recruitment for multiple sites. Um, one was a kind of trial management expert, and one was a statistical analysis expert. Which so um, I, I tried to ensure kind of all aspects of the fellowship from kind of start to finish were covered. So I think if um, if they if you can justify kind of what support and expertise they they they, they will bring then then that should be okay great thank you all should we do one more have you got time for one more guys or yeah yeah um we'll do one more very quickly and then yeah we'll have to call it a day unfortunately yeah. So a question here, can I nominate a research support supervisor at an overseas university? I think, uh, oh, sorry, go on this. No, go on, no, go on, you're all right, Judith. I was just going to say it's kind of, I guess, similar to what's already been discussed in, in terms of whether they'll have the, the time and the capacity to be able to support you in a Absolutely. The best way. Are they, you know, if they are the expert in the field, then I think you could make a good justification about why you've gone um, internationally for your one of your supervisors. But again, same things apply. Have they have they done supervision before, um, or have they got the time and are committed to you and this um, fellowship application to really support you in the delivery of the work? Let's do this. Yeah, so unfortunately, we're already quite over time. So I'm going to wrap it up um, and just thank you all for attending the webinar. I hope you've um, managed to get a lot of useful information out of it. Just my extended thanks to Judith, Amelia, Michael and Asma as well for taking part in the webinar today. If you have any further questions, do not hesitate to contact us at the Academy. Uh, as I mentioned, Asma's put that in the chat. Um, for If you're watching on YouTube, it's academy-awards at nihr.ac.uk. Yeah, and we look forward to receiving your query soon. So yeah, a massive thanks again for attending and take care. Thank you.